Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to Investing Sucks. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about a investing strategy that is by far one of the most talked about, debated, and followed investing strategies that is out there, and that is Magic Formula Investing. A few people have asked me to do a back test on Magic Formula Investing and to also give my thoughts on it overall. Do I agree with this approach? Does it make sense to follow it? Is it actually magical or has the magic dissipated from it? So I decided to make a full length video dedicated to exploring this strategy in depth. Now I've done a couple back test videos on my channel recently and one thing that I always stress whenever I do a back test video is a back test is only as good as the data that it's being back tested against. In order for a investing strategy for you to be able to say that that investing strategy will reliably outperform the market into the future because it did so in the past is if the data that you're back testing it against spans multiple decades and multiple different geographies. You need to have very in-depth data in order to say that. And what I'm working with here is really data only from a specific geography, which would be US stocks, Canadian stocks, as well as some foreign stocks. But with Magic Formula Investing specifically, what they detailed in the book that had the strategy in is that they only look at US stocks, which is interesting. And I'm only testing it against uh, one decade of data, which is what I have on my website here, tickernomics.com, which I'll leave a link in the description. I have one decade of data on here that I have loaded onto the site. So I can't really say by back testing this strategy myself that, you know, we can make a absolute determination that it's going to perform well into the future. So why am I making this video? Why am I back testing it? The whole point is to give granular level information on what a strategy actually looks like if you were to implement it in practice, because that's really what we're trying to do with these strategies, right? So it's one thing to hear from a book or from an external source that this strategy has outperformed the market in the past, you should follow it. And it's another thing to actually put into practice, right? I mean, that's ultimately what you're trying to do when you back test is find a strategy you can put into practice. So what I wanted to do here was see what it would look like if we were to put this strategy into practice. You know, what would it look like? What kind of stocks would we be buying? What would we have seen if we were looking at those stocks? What type of returns would we have got year to year? You know, answer those types of questions. So that's what I want to talk about in this video. I also want to talk about what I think the real draw is to magic formula investing to see, you know, what's the magic about? Is it really magic or did it just work for a few decades that they showed in the book? And there's really not much to it. And then, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm going to back test it myself. Uh, going, back, going back five years using my website here, Tickernomics. So without further ado, let's dive in. So a quick background on Magic Formula Investing. It was popularized by Joel Greenblatt, who is one of the most successful investors of all time. He runs a firm called Gotham Capital, which has had very strong returns for several decades. And so because of that, he's become very, very famous in the investing world. And in 2006, he wrote a book called The Little Book That Beats the Market, which detailed this method that we're going to look at of placing a focus on buying certain stocks, a portfolio of 20 to 30 stocks that have a combination of a high return on capital and a high earnings yield. And by doing that, you'd essentially be focusing on buying stocks that, for whatever reason, are out of favor by the market. So they're selling extremely cheaply but they're also deploying their capital very effectively and they're earning high returns on capital, at least doing that in the past year. Maybe not earning high returns on capital consistently into the future year after year, but at least in the past year they have, which is kind of what they looked at. Their metrics really looked at data from uh, the past year. So they didn't look at a five-year average or a 10-year average or anything like that. It was really just you know, income data from the past year and then balance sheet data from the most recent reporting period. So if you haven't read the book, I'd encourage you to check it out, especially if you are new to investing, because it does a fantastic job explaining how you should approach investing in a very, very simple way, which I think that really shows that the person who's writing the book knows what they're talking about, because anyone can explain investing. Anyone who knows a little bit about investing can explain it in a complex way and confuse you. But true genius relies on simplicity, in my opinion. And this book became very famous because of what Greenblatt in the book claimed that the strategy could do, which is consistently outperform the market over long term time horizons. Even if everyone knows about this strategy, he would still say that despite that, it would still outperform the market because it kind of goes against investor psychology, which is a pretty interesting thing. And what I have on screen here is a snippet from the book which details the results of this strategy. So he went from 1998 to 2004 or 1988 to 2004 
looking at this strategy specifically, and he said, if you were to follow this strategy, you would have earned 30.8% annualized return, which is obviously outstanding. If you can earn that return consistently into the future, then you're going to be a very wealthy individual. And then he compared that to the market average and also the S&P 500, which were essentially the same things uh, at about 12% per year. So more than double of the results of benchmark indexes. So obviously this caught a lot of people's attentions, you know, caught a lot of people off guard, especially because you'd think that if someone were to discover a strategy like this, why would they be revealing it to the world? Why would they be selling a book about it? Why wouldn't they just be following it and making billions of dollars? And well, as Greenblatt said in the book is because he thinks that even if people know about the strategy, it's still going to work because it goes against psychology, right? You're focusing on buying stocks that are out of favor by the market. You look at these companies and you just, you know, immediately, you know, you get a sour taste in your mouth. You look away. You don't even want anything to do with these companies. So that's why they're so cheap, but they are earning high returns on capital. And what's also interesting, if you look at the year by year results, is that the hot the, for the strategy, the highs are higher and the lows are lower. So, I mean, the strategy, it lost money in 2002, which is a year they lost 4% that year, which is a year where the market average lost 24% and the SP 500 lost 22%. So we can see why this caught a lot of people's attention. Now, despite all of this, what I think the real draw to the strategy or the lure to this strategy is, is not because of the market beating returns at its promise. Because to be honest, we know that as investors in the internet age, you look around everywhere online, there's always going to be, you know, someone promising you some market beating return or saying, follow my strategy, you're going to outperform the market, you're going to become extremely successful if you follow this strategy. It wasn't really because it was promising market beating returns, although that may have been a part of it. I think it was really just due to the simplicity, right? Because you're just focusing on two metrics, right? All you have to do is look at these two metrics, rank all the companies based on those two metrics, and then and then buy them according to those ranks, hold them for a year, and then rerun that list. And then for the companies that are no longer on it, sell them and use the funds from selling them to buy companies that are now on that list and just rinse and repeat year over year. It's a super, super simple strategy that's also intuitive, right? Because it makes sense from the perspective of a value investor, which is that you need to focus, you need to be going, willing to go to dark places of the market, you know, areas where most people are ignoring, they're not looking there. Maybe they look at a company and think there's no way that company's ever going to do good. There's just something about those companies that just make the average person turn away from them. Value investors would say those are the types of companies I want to focus on because that's where we can actually find market beating returns in, you know, the unwanted areas of the market. One very important thing to note about this strategy is that this is not a stock picking strategy. This is a portfolio strategy. The reason it works is because generally speaking, using last year's return on capital as a barometer for future return on capital is generally a good idea, right? On average, it's going to be around that range. But if you were to take something that is a general rule and apply it to individual companies, that's a very dangerous thing to do because there's a chance that that general rule that you're talking about isn't going to apply to the individual company that you're looking at. So you either have to go all in with this strategy or you have to not use it as all. There's no halfway you can go with this strategy. You cannot just kind of take the findings from this book and then say, okay, well, I'm just going to find any company out there that has a high return on capital and a low earnings yield, you know, relative to their peers or, you know, whatever metric you're looking at and say, because this strategy has said that these stocks tend to outperform the market, I'm just going to buy, I'm just going to pick companies that have those qualities and then see how I do. He described it as a portfolio strategy because on average, the strategy is going to work. If you look at, which we're going to do later in this video, if you look at, you know, the granular details of looking at the companies that you actually end up buying with this strategy, not all of them end up doing well. Some of them will lose 70, 80% of their value in one, in one year, which we're going to see. But then also some of them go up 120, 130% in one year, right? It works as a portfolio strategy, not on an individual company basis, because if you do use it on an individual company basis, you could get unlucky and just pick one of the companies that, you know, is, is going to end up going down. So if you're ever looking at a particular company and you go, oh, well, they're a magic formula company, maybe that's a positive thing to think about, then you're kind of looking at it wrong, in my opinion, because you have to approach it like I said, from the basis of a whole portfolio, not just individual companies. Okay, so now let's actually dive into the back test. So what I decided to do first was see if I can 
make an exact carbon copy of the list of magic formula stocks that appear when you actually look at it on the website versus what I did here. So what I did was make my own uh, script, again, using my website, tickernomics.com. It's called Magic Formula Investing. So if you want to access this yourself, then you just go to the website, create an account, and then you do what I just did, which is go to public scripts and you search Magic Formula Investing. And then when you click run, it will bring the script to the My Script section here. And then you click run again and it will generate the list. So I'll show you what the list looks like now. I had it up uh, earlier on when I made this video. Um, but if we go to the tables here, we can see all the companies and they are ranked. So the number one ranked here, which is the number one company in terms of those two metrics, return on capital and earnings yield. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to match the website here, which the website is magicformulainvesting.com. So this is also free. Anyone can go on this website and check it out. But if I generate the list, you're going to see that it is slightly different than what I have here. There's usually about two or three companies that are on both lists, but unfortunately I couldn't exactly replicate it. So in my opinion, I think in generating this list, there probably is some slight adjustments that they're making behind the scenes in order to just clean it up a bit and get a certain type of company. And maybe they didn't describe all of those adjustments in the book because as far as what I can tell, I followed the methodology that they described in the book you know, perfectly. I read the book, I read you know, how to generate the list and this is what I'm getting here. So it is close, there are some companies, but it's not perfect. Um, and what's interesting is that the number one company on this list, so the number one ranked company in terms of these two metrics is Herbalife Nutrition. So if anyone's heard of Herbalife before, you know that this company is basically the poster child for multi-level marketing. You know, they don't exactly have a great reputation. They're not a company that is well liked by people but that's kind of the purpose of this strategy right that's why it works because you're buying out of favor companies when most people look at herbalife they remember the whole mlm scam that was happening with this company and they think well no i'm not going to invest in that company i'm staying far away from that that's why this strategy works that's why their earnings yield is so low and it is you know undeniably a quality business when you look at it purely from a uh, return on invested capital standpoint if i take a look at return on invested capital uh, in the charts here, we can see how it's performed over the past and we can see it's been consistently quite high. I mean, the lowest we can see here would be this year here, which it was 53%, which is very, very high. You know, for each dollar they invest into their business, they're earning 50 cents back in terms of their profit just, you know, in the next year. And sometimes it was even higher than that. And if we look at the ratios here, we can compare Herbalife to a couple similar companies, which are these ones here, which these are, I guess, general food companies. You can see Kraft Heinz here, General Mills, Kellogg's, you know, a whole list of food companies here. So their return on invested capital in the last 12 months, 60%. The industry average is just under 9%, which is basically cost of capital if you think about it. So, I mean, despite all that, this company is still, they're doing something right, but they're valued very cheaply despite them performing very well seemingly. So that's that kind of gives you, you know, some insight into what this strategy actually looks like on an individual company basis, right? Like what type of companies are we actually buying under this strategy? And we can look at some other ones. There weren't really any other companies that kind of stood out to me. There was a few oil and gas companies, which these kind of strike me as more of the one-off companies. What I was interested to see was Malibu Boats, which is a company that I personally invested in myself about a month ago, and I made a video on this company as well. Um, you know, I didn't buy them knowing that they were a part of this list, but I was, you know, intrigued to see that they were included as a part of this list. And then one of their competitors here, Mastercraft Boat Holdings, which is in the same uh, industry, was also on this list. They were even ranked slightly higher than Malibu Boats. So, I mean, a few interesting insights there, but you get the idea when you look at these companies, you know, there's usually something about these companies that would turn the average investor away from them. Okay, but now let's actually take a look at some of the results of the five-year back test that I did at this strategy. So overall, the total portfolio return of this strategy for the past five years was 1.57% per year. So obviously not very good. And this does include uh, dividends as well. I did include dividends. I didn't just look at the price increase of the stocks. And what was also interesting was that in three out of the five years, this strategy would have lost value, which was a little bit surprising because if we go back to this screen here, which was something that's from the book, the strategy over the period that it was tested here only lost value one year and it went down uh, by 4%. 
But if we look at here, it lost value in three out of the five years. So following this strategy of buying high return on capital, high earnings yield stocks, it didn't really work that well, at least in the five years that I tested. And overall, it didn't do too well. Now, obviously, if we exclude this last year and we just look at these four years, then it would have performed very well. But it's really this last year that kind of really hurt the strategy, uh, at least for this time period that I'm looking at specifically. And some other statistics on it. Overall, you would have invested in 79 different companies. There were 21 instances where companies were held for uh, two, at least two years. And then there were two companies that you would held for three out of the five years. And those companies were uh, Warner Brothers and this company here, PetMed Express Incorporated, which is a pharmaceutical retailer, which is not a company that I had heard of. And the best performing stock in terms of a one year uh, total return you know, gain was Dine Brands Global, which you would have earned 130.6% return in one year. So that does go to show that you know, there are, this is how kind of, this is how the strategy works, right? You get these winners like this, but then you also get the major losers like this one, uh, Nexstar Media Group, which lost almost 90% in one year. So there's a very wide range, right? There is quite a lot of volatility in this strategy. And what I also noticed was there were 40, 47 out of the one year holdings you would have made money on and 53 you would have lost money on. So you were more likely to lose money on individual holding then make money following this strategy in the five years that I looked at. And then I also pulled up this here, which is kind of, you can think of it like a distribution of returns. So each dot that you see here represents a company's one year return. So this here would be the ones that perform the best, right? Because this is the percentage return here. And then over here would be the companies that perform the worst. So this one would be, you know, Nexstar Media Group. This one would be uh, Dine Brands here. And I think this is interesting to look at because obviously what you can see is that the tail of posit the positive tail uh, is a bit higher than the negative tail. And that's just kind of due to logistics, right? I mean, when you invest in a company, you can always make more than 100%. But when it comes to losing, you can really only lose 100%. So, but like, yeah, like I said, overall, you would have earned a positive return following this strategy, but not really one that even matched inflation. And it was really this last year here where the strategy performed really bad. And for all the skeptics out there, the people that are looking at this and saying, well, I want to take a look at, you know, what he did. I want to understand this better. To, you know, if you want to like audit my uh, analysis that I did here, I am going to post this Excel file. Uh, I'll put a link to uh, an Excel sheet file in the uh, link to the description of this video so you can check it out. And how I structured it was basically you know, starting back five years and then going from year five to four, four to three, three to two, all the way up to last year. So in each of these tabs here, you can see what the portfolio was, what, you know, the value st started as, which I assumed you started with a million dollars, and then what it ended that period as, and then, you know, carried the period over. So you can look at the individual companies that I bought throughout this, if you are interested in actually, you know, like I said, getting a more granular understanding of these types of companies. Now, one year that I want to give particular attention to is the last year. So this was as of the date that I ran this script, which is just as a few days ago, and then one year ago. So how did that portfolio of companies perform? And what was interesting to, to note was that there were only three companies that you actually would have made money on following this strategy from the past year. So I'll zoom in a bit more so you can see the three companies were this one here, which is Thrive Holdings, which you would have made 5% on. Uh, there's this one here, uh, Tenant Healthcare, which you would have made 9% on. And then the best performing one was International Money Express Incorporated, which is a software company that you would have made 44.5% on. So, I mean, of course, you could say, well, I mean, Eric, everything's gone down the past year, which, I mean, that's definitely true without a doubt. But there is a shocking number of companies here that have underperformed the market and even had extremely, extremely negative returns. You can see here... Tupperware Brands lost 78% of its value in the past year. Uh, Anywhere Real Estate Incorporated lost 63%. Um, Nexstar Media Group, which was the worst performing one that I talked about before, it lost 88%. Um, this one lost 42%. And there's a few other instances of that. So I was kind of shocked to see these companies perform as badly as they did, just because the takeaway that I kind of got from this strategy here was that but when you're buying these types of companies, even in years where the market 
you know, goes down, these companies won't go down as much on average, right? Which uh, didn't really seem to be the case here. I think the average uh, loss for this year of 26%, I think that's probably about par what the S&P 500 has lost in the past year, maybe slightly less, but it didn't really align with the results that I saw here. So I thought that was uh, an interesting finding. Maybe it's just a one-off anomaly year that isn't going to happen again, but I thought it was worth mentioning just because you know, this strategy is so, you know, sought after and so many people follow it. So many people think about it and are wondering about it. I think it was worth mentioning that. So my final thoughts on this strategy is personally, I really, really like the logic behind it. And I think for beginner investors specifically, learning a strategy like this can be very beneficial. It can teach you some extremely valuable lessons about investing because there is a very strong case to be made that humans just suck at investing, right? We're too emotionally driven. We can't think rationally when it comes to making decisions about our finances and specifically when it comes to deciding what companies to buy, what companies to sell, when is the best time to invest. We're just too emotionally driven creatures to be able to do that consistently and to actually outperform the market in the future. And something else that the book said in regards to going this route of picking individual companies and doing your own research on companies is that if you do decide to do that, you really need to focus on areas that you understand deeply and make few but concentrated bets. And then once you've made those bets, actively follow up on them. So understand the businesses after you've bought them, You know, keep up to date with what's going on and make sure you're well informed. And this is something that I've been practicing personally for the past two years now. I'm not constantly focusing on what's the next company to buy, you know, what's the next big industry to invest in, but instead focusing on my understanding of business models, understanding of factors influencing industries that I have a sizable stake in, and just trying to increase my knowledge, right? And of course, I'm not perfect. I'm still going to get some wrong, but it kind of helps with the learning process when you frame it in that way, instead of, you know, having fear of missing out and just looking at companies that have returned 100%. But instead, just more focusing on your own personal learning and trying to actually understand companies deeply and then making a concentrated bet once all the stars align. And what I mean by when all the stars align is that it's a business you understand, you can reasonably forecast their future, and they're priced cheaply relative to that future. Once all the stars align, then it's time to actually put your money where your mouth is and make a sizable bet. So yeah, the book has plenty of great lessons similar to that one I just described about investing, but personally, I don't plan on following magic formula investing just because, like I said before, you either have to go all in with this strategy or just kind of disregard it as a whole. And personally, I think if you're going to go all in with a strategy, there are other investing strategies out there that focus on specific types of stocks, such as factor investing, which I've talked about numerous times on this channel. Factor investing and certain factor investing strategies have been tested much more rigorously than magic formula investing. It's been tested across multiple decades, multiple different geographies. And if you're the type of person that you're okay with relying on the past results of investing strategy, then I think it'd make more sense to look into factor investing rather than magic formula investing. That is my personal opinion on the matter. But anyways, guys, that does it for this video. So thank you so much for sticking around. I hope you did find it useful. If you did, then please leave a like. And if you're new to my channel, I'd appreciate if you'd consider subscribing. And I'll see you guys in the next video.